Yo, so, you still surround in there? Look, I know you're in there. You guys to come out sometime. You know, we, we all worried about you. You know, it's like, already half the year done. You ain't done the movie yet. Look, I know you've been doing all like these like TV things and that's real cool and all, but like you, 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 you throw the cinema to the wayside and that's just like an infantile reaction, yo. There's so much there that you gotta take care of. Man, I don't even hear no water running. I have an idea. <laughs> you need some help. I'm gonna find the side of it. I do need help. Yeah. Not from you though. Teenagers have been around since the invention of eggs, and people are either annoyed by this newly smelly lot, or they're envious and even nostalgic of the teendom, depending on how their adulthood turned out. Some of us never escape. It's the time of emotional and physical turmoil, creating some of the most vivid and devastating memories in a human life. There's a reason childhood memories get fuzzy after traveling through that brain chemistry altering time. All of this upheaval leads to some... instability. While that makes being a teenager potentially miserable and definitely confusing, it makes for some great cinema. And filmmakers have been exploiting this fact since the 30s. Movies aimed at troubled youth have been a staple since Reefer Madness, but the focus shifted from Scourge to Savior with films like The Blob, where the cast not yet adult but definitely not child was central to the plot's movement. Before these portrayals, non-adults in film were either extras or victims. As movie studios tried to increase their demographic, they reached toward those teens with little responsibility and much disposable income. Slasher films would later cash in on this big time. But this trend went way out of control in a decade well known for its excess. The 80s. Hey, hey, hey. No, no. We already did that joke. And uh, try my best not to repeat myself. Hit it! Movies centering around that glorious time known as high school have been around since Greece, but gained so much momentum in the 1980s that there was a super group of teen idols called the Brat Pack, featured at the forefront of their wildly successful film The Breakfast Club and its ugly sister, St. Elmo's Fire. For those of you who don't know, the term Brat Pack was actually a play on words of an older group of actors called the Rat Pack, whose influence on cinema and popular culture resonated for generations. So, how apt was this comparison in hindsight? Well, the Rat Pack is to the Who as the Brat Pack is to Whitesnake. They both have their fans, but you really had to be there to understand. These bright youths starred in many of the 80s classics, and arguably some of the worst of the genre. But today, we're not talking about them. We're here to talk about the awkward middle child of the teen-focused 80s movie, Better Off Dead. It's a story about a boy who has the girl break his heart, so he tries to commit suicide, and you know, it's not going to focus on it as a downer. It actually plays as suicide scenes for laughs. Corlots. I'm getting a strange sense of deja vu. Unlike Heather's, Better Off Dead does not linger in the darker parts of the psyche for more than a moment. It does have a style that has since become the cliche and was definitely a product of its time. But with all that in mind, does this film stand up and make its cracking voice heard so many years after its relevance? Well, let's dig out the yearbook and take a look at the stumbling, awkward portrait that is better off dead. Wow, who thought that hair was a good idea? Meet Lane Meyer, played by a fresh off of 16 Candles John Cusack. He's the all-American teen, sleeping in on Sundays, half paying attention to his own life as he can think of nothing else, and head over heels in love with someone who literally throws him away in the first five minutes. I mean, at least he hasn't built his life around her yet. You know, she's just, um... Kind of a, a summer thing. Uh. Whoa. Dude. How are his parents okay with this? I mean, it was the era before creepy stalking was so common, but did she come over and see this? I think that's the reason she's breaking up with him. I would. The hell's. No! Don't do that! She actually explains why she did it right after he fails to make the Too ski bad. team. Real close. Next. Listen, Lane. I think we should talk. We've been seeing an awful lot of each other lately, and I really think it's in my best interest if I went out with someone more popular. Better looking, drives a nicer car. Kick him while he's down. That's right, she broke up with him to date the captain of said ski team, whose name is Roy Stalin. Subtlety is not this movie's strong suit. Where it does excel is perfectly capturing weird moments, like the classroom scene, for instance. 
Everyone's enthralled in math class and eager to share their homework. Everyone except Lane, of course, who forgot there was even an assignment. It's almost a parody scene, except this feels true. See, in the classroom at that age, even the most little humiliation is suddenly a vast pit of despair. All experiences are tenfold, and those people who actually did their homework and are happy to share it, they're the smug teacher's pets that you just want to punch in the face. That's one reason why high school drama is a very insulting term. Everything is totally blown out of proportion during that period. The actions of the plot follow this theme too. I mean, Lane gets dumped so he tries to end his world in futile ways, but then there's a dorky neighbor across the street that houses a hot foreign exchange student who he socially molests at every opportunity, cause you know, that's what you do I guess. The father has a standoff with the newspaper boy sucking at paper boy and breaking his garage windows. Wait, the parents act like this too? I honestly forgot how much time the movie spent with the rest of the family. See, you have Movie Dad, the most stock cinema parent ever committed to film, with bonding moments such as this. Come on, Lane. Mellow off. I Man, it's a brand new year. I understand there's a New Year's Eve dance at your school. You kids love this disco thing. Disco? Come on, Dad. You are really bringing me over, man. Classic. Then you have Trying Mom, who unfortunately fails at everything Mom. But... She does give forth that effort, and it's, it's, it's damn, it's damn sad. It's got, uh, raisins in it. You like raisins. There is still one more thing I would like to discuss with Lane. The subject is... She may be trying too hard, but at least she's not dangerous. Wait a minute here. Wait, this is death here. That was the Joker's pencil of its day, just so you know. They try to help Lane out as best they can, but he ultimately listens to nothing they have to say. It's a hallmark of the post-adolescent condition, where hearing works fine, but listening takes a few years off. Some people eventually grow out of this. Combine this with a lack of care about their own well-being, and you have to wonder how teenagers even survived before the modern era. Actually, they flourished. Oh, hey, Anthro. What now? What you've decried as the plague of youth has for centuries driven the core of human history. Teenagers have literally changed the world. Now, what? Before a change in diet and improvement of general health, most of the big movers and shakers of their day tapped into young adults, often in their mid-teens, to back their cause and fight against the powers that be. Their views were ready for shaping, their energy boundless. They worked the mines, the mills, and their minds. But they were children. Technically, they're minors, a term which was invented to brand those beneath the age of adult privilege, and this age has increased steadily since civilizations have developed. That explains why the median marriage age has progressively raised throughout the years. Adulthood came much earlier in the days before life expectancy increased. It wasn't unusual to see a, an oldest son at 14 taking charge of the household after his father died in some tragic accident at the worksite because that was sadly a very common case. 14 year olds heading the household nowadays would only be in the case of an emancipated youth, which, let's face it, is a sign of a troubled home life at best. What if these people are actually ready to step into their adult lives? They just legally can't because they are still minors. But the decisions that teenagers make are often impulsive and driven by emotion rather than thinking things through. Doesn't that explain most of human history? Oh, never considered that. You study the people today, I'll keep you apprised of the people from yesterday. So, with his parents' advice ignored and Stalin mocking him at every turn, Lane feels completely defeated, despite never having more than inconvenience thrown his way. Anyone on the outside can see he's his own worst enemy, but our hero is completely oblivious as the plot's events seem steered against him. Wait. The world actually is gunning for him, if it's the mob of paperboys going after him for their two dollars, or the Asian drag racers at every stoplight trying to get him to go. I mean, I know it's insane sounding, but that's actually how it feels when you're the- oh my 
God, this movie is shot from the perspective of a teenager. All the big emotions, the dramatic events, the blasé attitude towards repeated craziness and the bizarre, this is someone's diary. Specifically, Savage Steve Holland, the writer-director of Better Off Dead. According to sources, the film was so spot on to major events in his own life that his real-life equivalent to Beth called after she saw the film many years later and apologized for what he went through after she herself went to therapy. Ah! Yeah, this movie suddenly makes almost too much sense. Hell, to this day, John Cusack, the star, wants people to forget this movie is out there. Much like awkward teenage years, he just wants it put in the past and forgotten about, like an awkward prom photo you were forced to take. But whatever his opinion is, I like its oddball charm. This film takes big steps in weird directions with little or no warning. It just kind of does its own thing without regard for what the audience wants or expects. While that sounds rebellious, the cliches it has are so well known that South Park straight up stole its villain for one of its episodes. So, while on the surface outlandish and believing itself totally original, it walks the straight and narrow path without realizing it. Just like a real teenager. There's a visceral honesty to it, though, a, a sincerity that reminds you of your own past. Those, those moments and breakups that just felt all-encompassing in the moment, but a few months or years down the road, it's just another life event. You know what this movie is? It's the 80s teen version of Forgetting Sarah Marshall. The main character suffers a breakup from a blonde in the first five minutes, becomes despondent, he's told to take radical action to change his life, a new woman enters to help guide him to his own purpose, and he learns to succeed despite himself. Both tackle the aspect of needing to grow up and take a chance outside the comfort zone. High recommendation that that comparison can be made. So if you're looking for a psychological dive into the mind of a teenager, read a textbook. If you're looking for an experience through that scope of that hormonal time, Better Off Dead is your ticket. It's vividly itself, but don't tell its parents. It's, it'd get too embarrassed. I'm Socio, and I'm glad I'm well past those years. The scenes aren't played as downers, rather for laughs. Huh, I'm getting deja vu for some reason. Cattail was a nice touch, wasn't it?